Today, I'm going to be talking about P4ALL, which is our work on enabling modular switch programming under resource constraints. Traditionally, networks have used fixed function switches that don't have a lot of capacity for configuration. So this means that innovation with these switches can be quite slow. As an alternative though, we now have switches with a protocol independent switch architecture or PISA. These PISA switches have a programmable configuration. And these switches are currently on the market being used both in academic and industry settings. These are two examples of vendors that produce these switches. So to actually use these switches, we need the P4 programming language. This allows us to specify how a packet is parsed, basically what header fields we should expect, and what actions to take when the switch sees a packet. And we can express a wide variety of sophisticated applications in P4, including telemetry, like measuring heavy hitters, rate limiting, and identifying and mitigating network attacks. Ideally, P4 code should be reusable. By that, I mean we have our P4 program, we compile it, and it should run on any PISA switch without a problem. But in practice, P4 code just really isn't that reusable. The data structures that we might use, things like a hash table or a Kalman sketch, are valid for a range of different sizes. But P4 actually requires us to explicitly define the size, so the amount of memory needed for the structures. This becomes a problem because switches have very limited resources that have to be shared across all program elements. So a hash table in one application might be fine, but in a different application with more data structures, that hash table might be too big. So commonly used data structures have to be rewritten often based on the application they're being used in. So while P4 does make it possible to program the network, it does not make it easy. P4 gives us a circular development problem. So we have our P4 program, we try to compile it, and if it doesn't fit on the switch, we have to go back to the original P4 program and manually rewrite it until we get something that actually does fit on the switch and compiles. Our goal with P4ALL is to actually mitigate this circularity. We do this by allowing for reusable elastic data structures. With an elastic data structure, the size isn't explicitly defined by the programmer. Instead, we define the size using symbolic values that allow the data structure to stretch or shrink as needed. And P4ALL can then automatically size the program to make optimal use of the available switch resources. So in my talk today, I'm going to start by explaining why elastic structures are a good fit for the switch architecture, and then I'll go into some details about what P4ALL actually looks like. So to understand why we need elastic data structures, we first have to understand what the architecture looks like. In the PISA architecture, when a packet enters a switch, it starts at the programmable parser. This extracts header fields from the packet and populates them in the packet header vector. The packet header vector contains these header fields along with any additional metadata associated with the packet. The packet then enters the processing pipeline, which consists of a series of stages. And each stage contains a fixed set of resources. This includes ALUs, and these are used to perform actions in each stage. And the actions performed in a single stage have to happen concurrently. So two dependent actions have to go in two separate stages. Each stage also has a small number of registers that serve as persistent state. Once the packet reaches the end of the pipeline, it goes through the programmable deparser and then exits the switch. Now the number of stages and the resources associated with each stage are quite limited. And these limitations are why elastic data structures work so well. So let's say we have a data structure we want to fit onto our switch. Now, one thing we can do is just make the data structure as big as possible, use all the resources. Now this would be fine unless we have another data structure that we need to fit onto the switch. So because we can't just add more resources, we have to free them up by shrinking data structure one to fit data structure two onto the switch. So this, the shapes and sizes of these structures might change based on our application. So one data structure that we see quite often is a Kalman sketch. The Kalman sketch is a probabilistic data structure that can store approximate frequencies for a stream of items. 
So in this example, we have a sketch with three rows and four columns. So if our switch sees packet X, it can hash X to each of the three rows and increment the count there. Now if the switch sees packet Y, it does the same thing. And the reason why the sketch can only keep approximate frequencies is because we might have hash collisions. If we want to retrieve the count for a specific item, we take the minimum across the three rows. So in this case, our count for item X is one. And one place we can use a common sketch is in a data plane caching application. And this is based off of the net cache application from SOSP. So in our data plane cache, we have a switch storing a cache of the popular keys and a key value store. So the switch sees a request for key one. If key one is not cached in the switch, the switch forwards the request to the key value store. However, if that key is cached in the switch, the switch can respond and send the value to the requester without ever having to go to the key value store. So on our switch, we want to keep a list of all the popular keys and their corresponding values. However, the popularity of these keys may change over time. So ideally, we want our switch to be able to identify when an uncached key becomes popular enough to be cached. And this is where we can use our common sketch. So our common sketch can track the popularity of uncached keys. So if the switch sees a request for a key that is not in the cache, it will add it to the sketch. And if the estimated count in the sketch is greater than some threshold, let's say in this example greater than 80, we can insert the key into the cache because it's now become popular. So what does this look like on the switch? Well, one thing we can do is split the resources evenly, give half to the cache and half to the sketch. Or maybe we can decide that it's better for us to have a larger cache to store more keys and a smaller count in sketch. But how do we actually know what the best size for these data structure is? So it turns out that this is actually kind of a difficult question to answer because there's this trade-off between the resources and accuracy of the data structure. So for our count minge sketch, in this example, let's say we have an actual count of 50, and this version of the sketch will give us an estimated count of 80. Now let's say we make our sketch bigger, add more rows and more columns. This might give us a more accurate, accurate estimation. And this is because as we increase the size, we reduce the number of hash collisions. However, the more accurate sketch might not always be the best choice because it uses more resources. So our goal with P4ALL is to be able to express all versions of the sketch with a single elastic data structure. So how do we actually express these elastic data structures? So we can't express them in the way that P4 currently exists. So in P4, if we want to write a common sketch, we explicitly state we want three rows in our sketch, which correspond to our three register arrays. And each register array should contain four registers representing our columns. But now we actually want to represent this data structure that can change its size. So how do we do this? Well, we create these structures whose size depends on symbolic values. So we extend P4 to include these symbolic values. We can then define the data structure using those symbolic values. And so in this case, we have a symbolic array of register arrays that represents our sketch. So now that we've declared these elastic data structures, how do we actually access them? We don't know ahead of time how many rows our sketch will have. So we wanna be able to specify that regardless of the number of rows in our sketch, we wanna be able to access each of them. So to do this, we extend P4 to have compile time loops. These loops will eventually get unrolled by our P4L compiler, but this high level notation allows us to express a possible set of programs compactly. So in this example, we're saying for each row in our sketch, perform some action on it, which in this case is hashing and incrementing to that row. So the last piece of the P4L puzzle are the objective functions. And these represent that trade-off between resources and accuracy. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about the actual equation for these objective functions, but I will refer you to our paper for more details. But essentially, we can express the error of the sketch as a function of the number of columns. And so we extend P4 to include this. 
we write an objective function and then we specify whether we want to minimize or maximize that function. So in this case, we want to minimize the error of our sketch. We can also in P4 define multiple objective functions and then define them in a single statement to minimize or maximize. So now that we've written these elastic data structures, how do we actually optimize them? Our P4L compiler takes as input a P4L program and a target specification. This includes the resource constraints of the switch. The compiler then outputs concrete values for each of these symbolic values, which can be used to construct just a regular P4 program. And it outputs a mapping from program elements to pipeline stages. So our compiler is essentially solving a bin packing problem. We have three pipeline stages, and let's say we want to try to fit eight rows of our sketch onto those stages. Our compiler may find it can only fit six rows. So we'll output six for the number of symbolic rows, and it will output this layout of two rows per pipeline stage. So under the hood, what's happening is we are generating and solving an integer linear program, or an ILP. The constraints in our ILP correspond to the resource constraints of the switch. So this ensures that the resulting solution will fit within the resources that are available on the switch. And the ILP objective that we're optimizing is the objective function our P4L program. So in this case, our ILP will find a solution that minimizes the error of the sketch. So now that we've talked about the language and compiler, I'll go through a little bit of the evaluation that we did. So this is a selection of applications that we've written in P4ALL and compiled. Their compile times range from under one second to just under 30 seconds. And the application that had the longest compile time took about eight minutes. So we found that we were able to express a wide variety of different applications in P4ALL. And we also measured uh, the overhead of our ILP. So we used the symbolic Countman sketch to measure this and we varied the number of resources available on the target. So on our x-axis is the number of stages available, and we do this in relation to the number of stages available on the Tofino switch, and the y-axis is the number of components in our ILP. This is a sum of the number of constraints and variables. So as we can see, as the number of stages on the target increases, so does the size of the ILP and the time it takes to solve the ILP also increases. So when our target had the same number of stages as the Tofino, it took about 1.8 seconds to compile an elastic Countman sketch. And when we double the number of stages, it took about three and a half minutes. So we expect as the hardware improves and has more resources, we expect that P4All will still have an acceptable compile time. And so with that, I can conclude with a high level summary of P4All. So with P4ALL, we introduce these elastic data structures that can expand to use the available resources on the switch. And our P4ALL compiler finds the optimal structure size for specific applications. And our goal here is to develop reusable modules in P4ALL so that it's much easier to implement and deploy data plane applications. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions.